If you've purchased a new camera any time in the last few years, there's a good chance that your experience was similar to mine. You go online and get absolutely bombarded. It seems like every day there's a new camera and everyone has a strong opinion on it. This is the best mirrorless camera ever made and you need to upgrade it, but it has one big problem and you can actually avoid it at all costs. Over 18 kilo stuff gives me a bit of a headache, so let's go get some fresh air for this one. No one else can tell you what camera to buy. It's completely subjective and entirely dependent on what kind of footage you want to shoot using that camera. So what I want to do with this video is instead walk you through the different areas to consider when you're purchasing a new camera. Different things to look for and pay attention to and consider before you choose one. Starting with an area that I think gets a lot more attention than it deserves, which is the specs. How does the camera look on paper? This includes features like sensor size. There are three common sensor sizes for most cameras. You've got full frame, which is the largest, APS-C, which is a bit smaller, and then micro four thirds, which is the smallest. A larger sensor will capture more light, giving you better performance in low light and a shallower depth of field. This also includes resolution and frame rate. Some cameras can only record up to a certain frame rate in a given resolution, up to a certain resolution in a given frame rate, or they can only do a certain combination with a crop. So it's worth looking into that to make sure that the camera is not going to not offer something you need. For example, if you are a sports videographer, chances are it's worth making sure that you can record a decent resolution up to some pretty high frame rates for capturing those faster movements. Me, on the other hand, making a video like this, I want decent resolution, but I don't need super high frame rates. And finally, we have bit rate and bit depth, which are kind of a measure of how high quality the image is, how far you can push it in post before it begins to fall apart. So you have 8-bit, which is not too detailed. You can't do too much to it in post without breaking the image down noticeably. You have 10-bit, which can do almost anything you need it to, you can push it pretty far in the grade and still have good detail. And then you have 12 bits, which is, you can push it to hell and back and it still looks great. Another area to consider that has a bit of overlap with the specs section is image. How does the footage look? This includes dynamic range, which is just how much contrast the camera can capture before the brightest and darkest areas turn completely white and completely black. Then there's also highlight and shadow roll off, like how smoothly do those clipped highlights roll off into true white and true black? Is it kind of crunchy or is it nice and smooth? Also color science. Different cameras reproduce colors differently and you might prefer the look of one over the look of another. I like the skin tones when shooting on Panasonic. They're usually accurate and not patchy, but I prefer the greens when shooting on Sony. They're nice and muted, kind of deep and dark. The best way to assess image is just to use a camera, shoot some footage, edit some footage, try out different color profiles and see if you like how that footage looks. But you can also try just watching some other videos that people have made using that camera to get a general idea of how the footage looks. Next up, the editing process. It's important to consider not just yourself while shooting, but also your future self while you're editing this footage. Different cameras have different ways of making the editing process either more or less convenient. One of my favorite things about Blackmagic is shooting in B-RAW and being able to change the white balance and ISO in post. I found that makes color grading a lot faster and easier. Most of what we've talked about so far is kind of nerdy and high tech stuff, but it's important to also consider just the very basic like helpful gadgets and features that a camera has. The right ones can make it a lot more practical to actually shoot with a camera. One to consider is autofocus, and this depends on what you're shooting. Like if you're doing a narrative short film, then you probably won't have any need to use autofocus, but if you're shooting like action sports or making a vlog, then that autofocus could be really important. And it might be worth making sure that you look into a camera that has good autofocus. For example, Sony is known for having incredible autofocus for video. In-body stabilization can be incredibly useful for shooting video, especially in like a more run and gun environment or if you're shooting handheld, as well as display tools like zebras, false color, focus peaking. 
If you're shooting on the fly and not too worried about fine tuning the image, then these probably aren't a huge deal. But if you're someone who wants to take the time to get the best possible image out of a camera, these are going to help you do that. Incredible specs and a beautiful image are only valuable to the extent that a camera makes it practical for you to tap into them. Now getting even more basic, let's move on to form factor. Cameras come in all different shapes and sizes from large blocky cinema cameras to tiny smartphone sized mirrorless cameras. A larger camera can be helpful for stabilizing handheld footage or building out a rig, whereas a smaller camera can be great for accessing tighter locations and working faster. It really depends on what you're doing. In addition to the size and shape of a camera, also consider the button layout. Different buttons and dials can make it a lot faster and easier for you to capture footage using a camera. So if the button layout feels weird or it doesn't give you enough options, that's worth making a note of. Especially if you're making a documentary or maybe vlogging, you really need to be able to fly around a camera's interface quickly. And once you've considered all of those features that a camera might offer, you should also consider the cost. If a camera is cheaper, then you can invest that saved money into lenses and accessories that might provide more value than the additional features that you would get from a more expensive camera. You could even buy two cameras. And finally, before buying a camera, you need to consider it in the context of who you are and what you do. What does your process look like and what are you hoping to create using this camera? A food videographer and a video journalist are probably going to use completely different tools. Also consider the other tools that you're using. What lenses do you have? Maybe you've already built out a rig. A camera needs to fit into the big picture of your entire kit. And finally, I wanna run back through that list and give you the example of the camera that I use, which for the record is the Lumix S5. The specs are the S5's weakest area, but also the area that I care the least about. Sure, it would be nice sometimes to have some higher frame rates in 4K, but it does 90% of what I need it to do. This camera also has a beautiful image. I really like how the footage looks, and that was one of the main motivations for buying it, was having used it and seen the image and verified that I liked it. It's got great color science, great dynamic range, smooth highlight and shadow roll off. No complaints. The files are detailed enough that they give me plenty of room to edit and color grade, but the files aren't so massive that they make it inconvenient to sort and edit the footage. As for additional features, the autofocus is very subpar, but the stabilization and display tools are solid. And as for form factor, this is a small mirrorless camera that can go anywhere that I need it to go. Most of the time, I don't wanna draw attention to the fact that I'm filming, so having a nice small camera body helps me to blend in and look like just another tourist shooting for fun. As for cost, this camera is way cheaper than its competitors, so I have two. And for me, having two cameras actually makes a lot of sense. I can capture a time lapse on one while I'm using the other to shoot. I can put a different lens on each one and swap them out if I'm not in a position to change lenses. Or I can have the peace of mind that if a camera breaks while I'm on a trip, I'm not hosed. Overall, I found this to be a great option for a more active style of filmmaking, doing a lot of traveling and hiking and needing something that can go on a trip, can go to the top of a mountain and still deliver back great footage without slowing the process down too much. But that's me, you are not me, and you might not be doing the same things. You could be doing food videography in a studio. Should you get the S5? I don't know. I can't tell you what camera to buy and neither can anyone else, but hopefully this video has given you a decent roadmap to use next time you need to pick one out. Be sure to subscribe to Adorama TV for more videos just like this one. I would recommend a similar video we did several months back. It's basically the same, but for lenses. So I would check that one out, but there's also a gazillion other videos, so knock yourself out. And if you're feeling extra generous or extra curious, then there's a link in the description of this video where you can subscribe to me as well. But you didn't hear that from me. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, learned something new, enjoyed the change of scenery. I'm sure I did. And I will see you in the next one.